It's my joy and honor to introduce our second speaker for the day, Pastor Aisha Amrasekaran. Uh, she's a part of our Glow family. As I said, she's a granddaughter of our founder president, Mrs. Sylvia Veda Uh Aisha serves in the pastoral staff. Pastor Aisha serves in the pastoral staff of the Calvary Church for over two decades. And as I said yesterday, she, her love and passion for the Lord is so contagious. I hope all of y'all were blessed and challenged by the message she shared yesterday from the life. Do y'all remember who? Yeah, yes. You get one wife and one free. Yeah. Uh, so it's so, sometimes the answers we get is not the answers we want. Lord still reigns and he's still in control. So keep your hearts open as the Holy Spirit ministers to each one of us through Aisha. So please give her a warm, a glow, applause and welcome Aisha today. Good morning, everyone. Before we go into the word, I just uh, was thinking of all the preparation that goes into a conference such as this. We dress up and appear here, but there, there are months of, there's months of preparation that goes into hosting an event like this, and uh, so Grateful to the President and the National Board and all those who have put in uh, that prayer, that hard work, that diligence, the planning. Uh, I know very well what it entails having watched it. Um, I've not done any of the hard work, but I have watched it uh, for many decades. And uh, uh, I remember the time that speakers had to be invited by snail mail. So you pray and you post a letter to them. And then you wait for their response, uh, which comes sometimes, you know, maybe two months later. And uh, so a lot of preparation, a lot of planning. Uh, many weeks and months I have seen of being down on their knees and seeking the Lord, uh, just waiting for uh, his guidance, doing everything by the leading of the Spirit. Uh, just uh, so much of planning and preparation on on so many levels and uh, I, I've seen my grandmother do that uh, for many years and even you know the it's very you know a lot of type of preparation sometimes we think it's only one kind of preparation but you know sometimes her, her, her room light was on at two in the morning and you come down and you think so spiritual she's sitting there her cupboard is open she's looking at her saris <laughs> And she's trying to decide for the four days of the conference, what am I going to wear? You know, so there's, you know, you guys are laughing as if you've never done it. <laughs> um, but just grateful to God who leads us at every stage. And even what he is doing here in our hearts and our lives this morning uh, is the result of people who have prayed and planned and worked for it. And then with all of that, um, you partner with the Holy Spirit and he moves in our hearts and he's, he, he's here. And we can see a beautiful flow of the Spirit of God is flowing a bit too much for my comfort level, to be honest. Um, you know, yesterday we looked at uh, uh, the life of Leah and I mentioned that she's a buy one, get one free wife. And today... Uh, I want, I'm led to look at the life of Bathsheba, and I want to call her bathing beauty. But when um, Nancy began to preach, my blood ran cold. <laughs> 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 
because her scripture is a little too close to mine. But she's made my work easier because she's taken, you know, she's told you the story so I don't have to go there. Uh, but I believe that, you know, the Lord is moving and working through each of us, for each of us this morning. And I just uh, am so grateful to be part of what he is doing in our midst today. Uh, she looked at Second Samuel chapter 11, uh, 12. I am starting from chapter 11, Second Samuel chapter 11. And it tells us the story of uh, King David. It tells us a story of a king who should have been out to battle with his soldiers, but instead he was taking a stroll on his rooftop. And as he was walking around, he probably saw some movement, and then he looked, and he sees a woman bathing. Now, at that point, I don't want to catch hold of David and say, hey, you sinner, because Many times we also, you know, something catches our attention and we look, right? We see some movement, we see somebody going, we see, you know, we see something and we turn and look. But the problem is not that first look, the problem is when you keep looking, right? Sometimes uh, even when you are scrolling on your phone, there's something that pops up, you see it, what are you going to do there? Are you, going to, are you going to stay there and keep looking? Or are you going to look away and flick it off? But David, obviously, he, he kept looking, and that took him uh, spiraling down uh, on a path to commit a series of very serious sins, simply because he just did not have enough self-control to turn away and go back into his house. But I'm not looking at this story this morning from David's perspective. I was thinking that I will leave for a men's conference. <laughs> but I want to look at what happened uh, to Bathsheba, so named because she was taking a bath. Um, here she caught the attention of a king he kept looking and he progressed beyond that, sending word to find out who she was and ultimately summoning her uh, into the palace and then committing adultery with her. And after some time, you know, Bathsheba sends word to King David that she's pregnant and this leaves David kind of scrambling now to somehow cover up this uh, one sin that he did. And you know, sometimes when we look at kings or famous people, we admire uh, their fame, we admire their riches, we see the blessings that they have from being in some kind of a high position or a prominent position, but we don't realize that that position also carries a lot of responsibility and accountability, and so when you fall and you're up there on a pedestal, you have to, you know, you fall a long way down, and you have a lot of onlookers. There would have been other people who did the same thing that David did, but they didn't have to scramble to cover anything up. They didn't have to be so worried, uh, you know, what would happen if his story get, got out. But David had to do that because he was known. And when none of his plans to kind of cover up his sin worked, he had to engineer the death of Uriah by ensuring that he was placed in an unprotected area in the battleground. And all of these things actually took a lot of scheming and planning uh, on David's part. He was the mastermind, but he also had to involve other people and make them also scheme, uh, you know, send him coded messages and things like that, all to cover up the initial sin that David uh, committed. And Uriah died because David arranged for his killing. So, so David really is the murderer here. And then we find that Bathsheba is now a widow. 
And when her days of mourning are ended, we don't know how long uh, that, that would have been, but we do know that David would have tried to speed up the process uh, for obvious reasons. But he takes her into the palace as his wife and their son is born. But we read very clearly in the Bible that the thing that David did displeased the Lord. We know that. We don't actually have to read it. But um, it's clear to us, verse 27 of 2 Samuel chapter 11, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. And here, God had to punish David. And the punishment, one of the punishments is that this child is going to die. And then, as Nancy shared, David wrestles uh, with God in, in his sorrow, obviously. But the child does indeed die. And you know, in this passage, we are told a great deal about David's deeds, David's misdeeds, uh, David's emotion right throughout the story, but very little is mentioned about Bathsheba and what she would have been feeling. When King David summoned Bathsheba to the palace, we are not really sure what she felt at that moment. I don't know whether she was kind of on some level honored or excited kind of wondering, you know, I've been picked. But whatever she felt, she was certainly not in a position of being able to say no to the king. And so it's most likely that she went along with whatever David intended to do without much say. I don't know, could she have protested? Could she have refused? Could she have, you know, said to David, I'm a married woman, I can't do this? We may never know. Only God will know the extent to which Bathsheba was also complicit to this act. But what we do know is that there was gross abuse of David's power and his authority as the king and Bathsheba was no doubt under his domination. You know, the, the, a king, a ruler, is there to protect the people, to protect their rights, to represent them, to stand up for them. I think even in our context when we are electing our kings, we remind them, you're here for the people. You're here to stand up for the people. You're here to protect their rights. You're here to defend their rights. So that was David's role as well. And he violated that role by inviting Bathsheba into his life in that capacity. When she went through these tragic circumstances, I think it would be very unlikely that Bathsheba would have known that David was the reason that her husband was dead. See, David went through great pains to keep this whole plot very secret. He wouldn't have wanted to be embarrassed. He wouldn't have wanted to be blamed. Bathsheba was given a very short mourning period. And after this, she had to transfer her affections now to her new husband, David. I don't know how people could do things like that. You know, how could we expect Bathsheba to kind of do that? It surely would have been a very difficult and a traumatic thing in the midst of mourning, in the midst of grief, to now turn your heart to someone else. And I'm sure that even though she was not in a position to share this with anybody, there must have been some level of guilt inside of her. Some realization that she's also part of this, some kind of shame, 
uh, you know, that, that, that she's also part of this whole, whole story, and that was mixed in with the grief of, of losing her husband. Who can she tell? No one. Who can she share this story with? No one. She couldn't have even opened her heart to David because the, the shame and the guilt inside of her as well would have been welling up and, and combining with the grief that she had over being a widow. And to add to this, this child also dies. And it's a sign of God's displeasure over David's sin. In the Bible stories, we see everything is focusing on David. You know, it's his sin, God's punishment upon him, David's response, David wrestling with God, um, David hoping that God would change his punishment, and God doesn't do it, and, and, it's, and it's almost def depicted as if David is the one who is primarily suffering here. But I want us to think uh, for a moment about the probable mental and emotional state of Bathsheba too. The guilt inside of her for whatever had transpired with David. Grief over the sudden death of her husband and now grief over the death of her baby. We read these stories very casually, but this was actually an awful, awful situation to be in. In my years of serving the Lord and working with people, I've come to personally believe that actually the, the, the worst kind of grief is a parent being alive while a child passes away. It's a total unnatural order of life, and I think we're not prepared for that kind of grief. And um, that's the mindset, that's, that's what Bathsheba was going through. And if there's any parent here who has gone through that kind of, of, of grief in your life, I just want to extend my, my heartfelt sympathy and compassion to you. Um, may God help you carry um, those things with his grace and his comfort. So you can just imagine the pain that Bathsheba is going through, all this sorrow, and it was not initiated by her. It was not, she's not the one who started this chain of action. King David abused his power. He gave in to his own lusts. And then as a result, Bathsheba suffers two deaths. Her life was actually a heap of ashes. And even in this heap of ashes, the biblical account doesn't even give much attention to her or focus on the extent of the pain that she's going through or the fact that she has been violated in such a gross manner. And so for a moment I'm thinking, was it only David who mattered to God? Was it only David who was grieving the death of his son? Why were Bathsheba's thoughts and feelings and pains so insignificant that they didn't even warrant honorable mention? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Perhaps there are people sitting here who've been violated, abused, subjected to pain and grief and incomprehensible suffering because of someone else abusing their power. I believe Bathsheba's stories has a few ways in which it could relate to our lives. And that's what I want to share with us this morning. Bathsheba was living in a season where she was dominated. And because of the brokenness and the fallenness and the sin that is prevalent in our world, and even as women particularly, the truth is that there are many situations in our lives, both significant situations as well as perhaps 
insignificant or passing ones, where we will be dominated over, um, made to feel powerless, taken advantage of. And in some of these situations, you may be fully innocent or you may be partially to blame, but the situation has come, up, come about because of someone else exercising dominion or undue power over you. And in some of these situations, our grief and our pain and our struggle will not be recognized or acknowledged and you may not even be given the space or the freedom to grieve, to process or to just have someone validate that pain. But Shiva seemed to have been brushed over in all her pain and suffering. And sometimes we might feel like that. We are going through untold suffering. Inside of us, we are, we are buried in the ashes. And we don't have a forum, and we don't have a voice, and we don't have any kind of space, safe space anywhere where we are able to come out with that which is weighing us down. Your emotions, your feelings uh, may just be kind of disregarded, ignored, cast aside, dismissed, even when you try to share it. And you're going to feel like you know, you're, you're under somebody's dominion. I think as women, there are a lot of moments like that. There are a lot of seasons in our lives like that. And, and that's, that's, that's the hard truth. And some of you may be going through that kind of a season even this morning. The second thing that we see in this story is the incredible forgiveness of God and the power of forgiveness when it is exercised by God towards us and by us towards ourselves and released towards other people. David didn't repent immediately. It's not like David did something wrong and the next day he was convicted. He, he lived with this unconfessed, undealt with sin for quite some time until Nathan the prophet comes to him and confronts him and has to tell him a story to illustrate the issue and then even speak so directly to David in order to bring some conviction and uh, a realization of his sinfulness. But David was able to experience the forgiveness of God when he came clean. And this was a powerful, all-encompassing, complete forgiveness that God lavished upon him. Psalm 103 I referred to it yesterday. This psalm was actually written by David. Maybe he wrote it because he, he, he experienced, he just didn't conceptually pronounce, but he experienced God's forgiveness in his life. Psalm 103 verse 11, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We see that God, terrible as David's sins were, forgave him completely and restored him and did something marvelous in his life, so much so that we don't define David from this action. 
we define david as a worshipper we define david as the greatest king that israel had that's how we think of david we we think of him as the author of psalm 23 we think of all the wonderful restoring things that god did in david's life and all of that was because god forgave him he experienced god's forgiveness even in the midst of the deepest darkest dirtiest sins that he had committed but what about bathsheba after some time i'm pretty sure especially after nathan confronted david bathsheba would have come to understand the full extent of what david did not just that he you know summoned her and took her uh, to be you know be with him when she was another man's wife but she would have also at some point come into the realization of how david killed or engineered the death of her husband and now she has to come and be with this man and love him a murderer of her own husband as her husband yet there is absolutely no indication anywhere in scripture that bathsheba had kind of a hatred or a bitterness towards david for causing so much pain in her life in fact it it even seems that their their relationship grew and and it was strengthened because the word of god tells us that that david comforted his wife in the death of their son and there's one thing that i know you cannot accept comfort from a person who is to blame for the adversity in your life right if they have caused your pain if they have caused your shame how can you accept comfort from them it doesn't make sense it would only be a kind of a cosmetic comfort if so i was thinking of a story i heard which happened to a friend of my um, uh, someone who was known to me some years ago this guy had uh, uh, a son he had stolen some jewelry of his mother's and pawned it and uh, then the mother discovered that the jewelry was missing and the son helped her look for it <laughs> is that comfort appears seems very concerned where is this chain but it was a cosmetic comfort because he was the cause of the pain he was the thief you know but in david and bathsheba's life we don't see that kind of a cosmetic comfort um but we do see that there seems to be some kind of a unity in their suffering and a settling in to that relationship So even as David confessed his sin to God and experienced the power of God's amazing forgiveness in his life for what he had done it it shows us also that Bathsheba would have extended forgiveness in her heart towards David and was able to move beyond that episode of grief and just blaming him for all the pain uh, the 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 loss and the struggles in her life that forgiveness is what would have enabled them to progress in their lives and move forward and the supreme example of this kind of forgiveness is Christ's death on the cross for our sins where we receive forgiveness we receive deliverance and we we receive a new start a new beginning and there is hope as we become a new creation in Christ and as we experience the power of Christ's forgiveness in our own lives i cannot emphasize enough the incredible power that forgiving others brings into our lives to free us and to help us walk out of the heaps of ashes that we are in Bathsheba had been through a level of grief that I pray many of us will not have to face in our lives the death of a husband the early death of a husband as well as the death of a child 
However, she was able to have a new beginning. She was able to have another successful chapter in her life written only because she was able to release forgiveness to David and also able to, to, to forgive herself for her part in whatever had transpired. But Shiva couldn't erase the past events and we cannot erase the past events of our lives as well. But we can learn to be comforted by God. We can learn to be forgiven by God. And we can learn to forgive those, even those who have brought grief and death and pain and suffering in our lives. There is power in forgiveness. You know, when we, when we look at the ash heaps of our own lives and the struggles that some of us may be going through even this morning. Many of these heaps have a connection to unforgiveness. Sometimes there are situations in our lives that have come about because we gave into temptation, because we gave into stupidity, uh, because we made certain mistakes, uh, we were sinful, we were foolish. And also some of these ash heaps are there because others have dominated over us. They have abused uh, their power. They have taken advantage of us. They have hurt us. They have offended us. They have humiliated us and they have grieved us. But we are still in the ash heap because we can't forgive. We are still in the ash heap because we can't let go. We can't release. We can't release people from paying for that. And sometimes we don't even realize how deep this pain is. And we don't realize or make that connection between the pain in our ash heap to the fact that we are walking in unforgiveness. Sometimes it's like something buried there and we don't even think about it. On the other hand, there are those air sheeps that we are in. There are those situations in which we are in where we are in full awareness that someone has done something to us. This is why we are mad. This is why we are upset. This is why we are in this heap of ashes. And we acknowledge to ourselves and we say to ourselves, I am not going to forgive this person. He does not deserve to be forgiven. They do not deserve to have their sin wiped off. They do not deserve to have their sin kept private or silent. They must pay. There must be some revenge. They must be humiliated. Why is it only me that must be humiliated? They should be stripped of their titles. They should be stripped of their uh, possessions. They should be stripped of their reputation or their riches. They must somehow pay. And we, there is something burning inside us, this unforgiveness. We need revenge. We need vindication. And we tell ourselves, it's just justice. I need justice. And we don't realize that making this the pursuit of our lives ends up in just being us who are hurting. It's us who are stuck. And it is us who are wallowing in that heap of ashes. And I'm calling us out this morning, not to a place where you feel like forgiving. I can't make you feel like forgiving. And the truth is, many times, you don't feel like forgiving at all, especially when the effects of that abuse of power or that dominion is continuing in your life. You may not feel like forgiving, but I am calling you to a decision to forgive. It may be the last thing that you feel like doing, the last thing you, you want to do, and you may be kicking yourself for even being in this place this morning because you don't want to hear it. And you might have even told yourself or told someone else, I will never ever forgive this person for what they have done. But you know, 
God is calling you this morning to release forgiveness. And I say that with a deep sense of compelling of the Holy Spirit. There are some specific people here. I don't know who you are and I don't know what your situation is. But I can tell you beyond a shadow of doubt that if there is something ticking inside of you, something resonating inside of you, it is the power of the Holy Spirit because God knows your situation. And God knows those of us who are smiling on the outside, who sometimes help to search for the chain which we stole. But inside there is a sense of bitterness and unforgiveness. God is calling you to this hard but powerful step. God forgave David and Bathsheba both completely. And out of their union, Solomon uh, was born. And this son lived. And this son was loved by God and chosen by God. God is so much more forgiving and loving and gracious than we are. He doesn't hold our sins against us. He doesn't keep bringing it in front of us and dangling in front of us every time something good happens to say, but remember what you did. We do that. And there are some of us, you know, we can't remember what we had for breakfast, but we can remember what somebody did 35 years ago. And not only do we you know, remember that we feel it's our bounden duty to share it with others. <laughs> and so there's a person who has a terrible past, but now the Lord has done something new in their lives. But you feel you need to keep saying, but did you know? I don't know whether it's part of our Asian culture. We are like that a little bit. Because everybody knows everybody, someone, someone, you're related to this one, that one, everyone. And so you can always find some connection. And oftentimes these connections are, you know, they have a lot of stories attached to them. We don't know very much about uh, Bathsheba from this point onwards, except for just one or two brief interactions which we see mentioned in scripture um, in the last stages of David's life. Something happens uh, when David is ending his life uh, or coming to the end of it. God had promised or God had expressed his desire that Solomon, the son of this union, would be the next king. You can read it in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. Verse 4, First Chronicles chapter 8, verse 4. However, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he was pleased with me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Now he has said to me, it is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he is steadfast to observe my commandments and my judgments as it is this day. So Solomon was not David's choice. Solomon was God's choice. And that is interesting and encouraging for us because it shows us that God's choice sometimes comes from the heap of ashes, not from the pristine background, not from some sinless lily-white past, 
But sometimes out of the ash heaps, sometimes out of the mistakes, sometimes out of the grief and the pain and the suffering and the sin, God makes a new beginning and does something wonderful. And so God had chosen Solomon to be the king after David. But we find that when David was nearing the end of his life, since he had many sons, I guess they had many aspirations. And we find that one of his sons decides that he's going to be king while David was still alive. And so he proclaims that he's the king and he makes preparation to crown himself king. And then Nathan, the prophet, speaks to Bathsheba and gives her assign an assignment. First Kings chapter 1, verse 11. So Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? Come, please, let me now give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go immediately to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? And then we find that Bathsheba, in verse 16, did exactly as Nathan said. It says that she bowed before and did homage to the king, and then the king said, What is your wish? Then she said to him, My Lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. So now, look, Adonijah has become king, and now, my Lord the king, you do not know about it. He has sacrificed oxen and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army, but Solomon your servant he has not invited. And as for you, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will happen when my lord the king rests with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. And just then, while she was still talking with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. So they told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today and has sacrificed oxen and fattened cattle and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the king's sons and the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. And look, they are eating and drinking before him, and they say, Long live king Adonijah. But he has not invited me, your servant, nor Zadok the priest, nor Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, nor your servant Solomon. Has this thing been done my, by my lord the king? And you have not told your servant who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Then King David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath and said, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, so I certainly will do this day. I want you to understand what was happening to Bathsheba at this point. You see, husband and wife relationships and king and queen relationships, very different to uh, most of our marriages now. When we want to talk to a husband, we don't go and pay homage to them. Sometimes they have to pay homage to us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm very freely saying these things because my husband is not here. We don't have to kind of bow down in resp respect to them. Of course, we do respect them, but we don't have to bow down. We don't have to ask for permission to speak. Uh, we don't have that kind of, you know, that kind of a relationship. But, but be 
because of the restrictions of that kind of a relationship, I want you to understand how significant it was that Bathsheba had that place where she could come to David and advise him. And he took her advice and he acted on it. The tables have completely turned. At the beginning of the story, Bathsheba is being dominated over. She didn't have a voice. She didn't have a choice. She had nothing. She was going through that season in her life where things were being done to her and she was powerless. Now, years later, God has brought her to this place where she has the courage, where she has the confidence, where she has the space to come before the king of Israel and tell him a thing or two and advise him and see him take her advice. Bathsheba had journeyed from a place of powerlessness, shame, and grief, now to a place of influence, authority, and confidence. How did she come to that place? God brought her there. As I was prayerfully praying over this message, I sensed that the Lord wanted to give a very specific word to some of the ladies who are here today. You may be in a season of being victimized, dominated, silenced, ignored, shamed, or trapped in your circumstances. If any of that is due to anything that you have done, and if you need to come clean with God, come clean with him. If you need to put certain things right, put it right. One of the things that we have to mention about David here and about Bathsheba too is that they turned from what they did and they didn't walk back in that lifestyle. It was a mistake, they put it right and they walked in righteousness before God. If you need to forgive yourself for something that you have done, make a decision to do that. If you need to release Forgiveness to others, make a choice to do that. But some of you are going to come into a place of influence. An elevation that only God can do. Like he did it for Bathsheba. It's not an elevation or a voice that you can take by force. You can't grab it. You can say, I will be this. You can't say, I will be this. I will do this. But it is a place of influence, a place of authority, a place of confidence, a season of influence that God is going to take you to. So live righteously. Honor God in all that you do. Seek to hear his voice very clearly and let him prepare you for your season of influence. It is coming and God will do it. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you and honor you for the power of your word. And for the way that your word comes and speaks into the very real situations of our lives. The way that your word shines upon the darkness and the pain and the struggle and the grief and the sin of our lives and the way that your word illuminates it and shows us that there is hope. There is a new beginning. There is a new season coming with you. And Lord, I pray for every man and woman in this place this morning for which your word went out this morning and touched in some area of their lives. For those who are being dominated over, I pray your grace and your strength and your patience and your endurance to go through this season of their lives with grace and with humility. For those who need to release 
forgiveness to others who need to release forgiveness over their own lives and their own mistakes, who need to experience the power of the forgiveness that only you can bring. I just speak forgiveness over us this morning and I, and I, and I ask Lord that you will help us to make that decision to forgive. And let us make that decision and as we make that decision, that feeling to forgive will follow. But you help us with the decision, Lord. Give us that resolve. Give us that conviction. I must honor God in this area. And finally, I pray for those, Lord, who you are speaking to this morning to hold on. Their season of influence is coming. Those women that you have handpicked for a certain time and a certain place where their lives are going to be changed from being dominated over to being one who speaks hope and life and, and healing and, and advisors and counsels and just brings influence and authority into, into their situations. Let them keenly hear your voice so that they will discern the times and the seasons of their lives and not rush things, but wait for your time. And when that time comes, let them remember this word and know God has done it. Amen.